I'm astronomer David Kerner, and I'm going to talk about multicultural perspectives in looking at the night sky as part of our virtual presentation of the Flagstaff Star Party. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Imagine for a minute that you are looking at the night sky for the very first time and nobody's told you anything about it whatsoever. What would you make of it? You'd see these faint little lights in the sky uh, glittering and sometimes twinkling on and off. You might think, wow, what does that look like? And by analogy, uh, come up with something to compare it to. The rhyme says, like a diamond in the sky, uh, but you still wouldn't know. So what would you do next? Especially if you're a young child and nobody ever read to you about the stars. You'd ask somebody. You'd ask somebody you knew or somebody in your community. And you'd say, what is all that? And they would have a story to tell you. And that story might be a scientific story, or it might be, if you're very young, a nursery rhyme story. Uh, it could be uh, anything from a cultural perspective. Now, the point of this is for us to understand that we can't observe anything in the natural world without having a cultural interpretation that tells us how to understand it. And that cultural interpretation uh, is what guides us to get meaning from the observations that we make. Now, what do we mean by culture? That's kind of a a hot word, not only these days, but in the past. In the 19th century, anthropologists began to define culture as something they could study. And one of the first definitions still holds to some extent the complex whole that has within it knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, big laundry list, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. Now you can see that's a big list, and lest you think that uh, that's etched in stone, uh, understand that in the middle of the 20th century, anthropologists began to put together and compile the number of different definitions of culture that they had come up with. And they had lists that ran into the hundreds. Nevertheless, still today, uh, this definition that we see here is largely correct, and I'd like to point out a couple things. It includes knowledge, it includes belief, it includes art, and at the very end of this, it points out that these are uh, attributes that are part of a society. So it also has a group aspect to it. It's something that's held not just by an individual, but also believed by a group of people of which you are a member. Well, what does this have to do with astronomy and looking at the sky? There is, in fact, a growing field of study called cultural astronomy. And what is possibly meant by that? Uh, here are some of the latest uh, definitions, a set of interdisciplinary fields studying the astronomical systems of current or ancient societies and cultures. And it includes sub-areas like archaeoastronomy, ethno-astronomy, historical astronomy, and the history of astronomy and astrology. So people study these things largely in an anthropological or historical perspective, uh, and that's part of what we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about all this in detail. Uh, two things, though, I'd like you to know about are these big words, archaeoastronomy and ethno-astronomy. What are those? Well, archaeoastronomy sounds like the beginning of archaeology, is a subfield of archaeology in which anthropologists study ancient ruins and artifacts to try to infer uh, what those people who are no longer available to us believed about the night sky. How would they do that? These are societies that haven't left written records and don't have members around that can explain things to us. Basically, they study ruins of buildings and artifacts and compare them to observations of the night sky to see if there are any correlations. And often there are remarkable ones. The seasons and times of the year were very important to ancient native cultures and determining the timing of their onset and cessation uh, was extremely important and done largely 
by astronomical observations. And we can see buildings and openings and monoliths that are arranged in such a way to uh, pinpoint the timing of things like winter solstice or summer solstice and many other cycles. So that's archaeoastronomy. Now that I've told you that, we're not going to talk about that too much. We're going to spend more time on this other sub-area of cultural astronomy, ethnoastronomy. Of course, ethnicity refers to a culture, a particular group with common beliefs. Ethnoastronomy then is the study of sky watching and ideas about the sky in a contemporary society or a society that has uh, a recent written record and has written about their observation of the sky. And so now this is separated from archaeology because we have uh, a language record of their thoughts about the sky. A good example, we have Navajo culture uh, that is around today and still tells us about their understanding of constellations. Uh, here's a constellation which we usually don't call one in the West, but is one to the Navajo, the Pleiades. If you have ever seen the Pleiades, they're a fuzzy patch in the sky and you may be able to make out individual stars. Uh, Dilyehe is uh, believed by the Navajo tradition to be a group called the Hard Flint Boys, and its timing and appearance in the sky is very important for agricultural reasons. Uh, the, when the Dilyehe disappears in the glare of the setting sun uh, in mid to late spring, this is a good time to plant your crops. When it reappears out of the glare of the rising sun in late summer, stop planting because your crops will not last into the hard frosts of fall. And so you can see there are two aspects to Dilyehe. There's a narrative and a story, a cultural story uh, with a moral, which I haven't gone into. Uh, I refer you, I don't know if he tells this story, but I refer you to the other talk by Brian Bates, uh, which will talk about Navajo constellations. Uh, but then there's also uh, an applied science role. When do you plant your crops? So these two aspects appear uh, in ethnoastronomy, and uh, we can appreciate the sky a lot by knowing native ethnoastronomies. All right, let's come to this philosophical issue. And that is, what is the role of science in culture, and why bring this up? Because we think of astronomy as a science. So what do we mean by saying cultural astronomy? Is science part of culture? Uh, and uh, what, what is that? Well, we've talked about a definition of culture which includes knowledge. Remember, culture includes knowledge. Uh, then what is science? And science has a multi-defined word as well, and that causes some no end of confusion. If you're a scientist like myself, talking to other scientists, you think of science often as a process of learning using something called the scientific method. And you've probably heard about this in grammar school. It involves making observations and having an idea about what they mean and then testing your idea with further observations. That's kind of the narrowest view of science, but working scientists usually defer to that explanation. If you look in the dictionary, you'll see a broader view, which includes a body of knowledge. So the science of astronomy would be not just the process of the scientific method, but the entire body of knowledge that scientists have derived from the scientific method about stars, etc. Okay, we've kind of covered that. Well then, how do those definitions apply to our understanding of the relationship between science and culture? Well, culture includes knowledge, so the body of knowledge is safely within the cultural domain, right? Modern science and all of its knowledge is part of modern culture. Um, what about the process itself, this idea of the scientific method? That deserves uh, a little bit more exploration. And let's, let's go back a little, because people don't talk about this so much. We astronomers, I think, especially are in the habit of referring always to the birth of modern science as happening at the Copernican Revolution. It's, it's when we understood that the Earth goes around the sun and then science was born. That's a little superficial and it's a little glib and it doesn't say anything about the scientific method. The scientific method historically came to be widely accepted uh, in the late 17th century as part of the work of Sir Francis Bacon. Here you can see him with his big stuffy collar. And he was active, uh, overlapping in the reign of Elizabeth I and James I. 
in one of the most active colonial periods of England. And this is where the scientific method was born. He wrote a work called The New Method, or in Latin, Novum Organum. Uh, and it was contrasted with the methods of Aristotle, which emphasized logic more than making observations. And so at the time, uh, the science of his day was filled with lots of fanciful explanations for things which seemed logical but often defied observations. And uh, Sir Francis Bacon was getting a little sick and tired of this. So he wrote his method and it took a while after his death before people began, began to agree with him that you need to emphasize making observations. It doesn't matter how attractive your theory is. If it doesn't agree with observations, it shouldn't be acknowledged. Well, that's the heart of the scientific method. But something to understand about Sir Francis Bacon in this colonial period, um, he was very, very focused on using science to control nature in order to improve lifestyle and also to build wealth because this was the mindset of the 17th century. Now, neither of those motives or uses of science are inherent to the use of the scientific method itself but they very much influenced the course of science so that following the use of the scientific method, uh, we come upon the Industrial Revolution uh, and the idea of the universe as a machine. So in this view, science is meant to find out how the machine works so you can be the one to run it. Now let's keep that in mind because that's a cultural influence on the use of science in Western culture and it contrasts with uh, other perspectives. In particular, is there such a thing as a native science? And uh, what would its values and perspective be? Well, there is a uh, thought to be, and it is of course the case that uh, native societies had broad pools of knowledge that were both cultural and scientific in the broader sense. These are called from observations as well, right? I mean, which herb will kill you and which will not? That's an observation. Which one has healing power? Which crops are the most nutritious? Observations were made even without the benefit of uh, the strict adherence of the scientific method. And they determined the body of knowledge that native societies had. And yet, the philosophies behind the use of these observations were vastly different in Native American societies. The relationship with nature was not one of control. It was one of reciprocity. Nature itself was not believed to be a lifeless machine, but was seen as a kind of being with which you negotiated and worked things out to get along with. Um, if you're thinking like I do, wow, we could use more of that today, I agree with you. Uh, strictly controlling and telling nature what to do doesn't always work. Even in the most modern view of science today, we understand we are part of the natural world and we have to collaborate with it. So the native values in science are appropriate to the modern view. Um, it was also more inductive in the sense that it had to do with gathering observations rather than forming ideas and testing them all the time. Now at this point, forgive me for going so philosophical, but I have to make a couple points which when I've taught a class in this subject, I've found were really important. Uh, first of all, Western culture is not the same as modern science. Uh, that's clearly evident if you follow the news, but it's very easy to get into the trap as a scientist of thinking of Western science and Western culture as, as the, uh, the epitome of where we're at. That's kind of a patronizing view to other cultures, you have to admit, and it's also not true. And let's look at uh, when we look back at Western culture. Western culture has a lot of pre-science and pre-modern uh, roots to it, which were in effect at the time of contact between Western and native culture. And it's important to realize that. First off, good old Christopher Columbus came to the Western Hemisphere before Copernicus ever even wrote his book. So he can't in any way be considered to be in a culture that was up with modern science. And second, I'd like to point out, if we come up today, we find in Western culture that there are still a large number of people who adhere to the old traditional views that are pre-scientific. Uh, we have a huge contingent that believes in astrology, 
which whatever you think about it, is not widely accepted in modern science as a good account of personality details. Um, we have a lot of people who believe religious accounts of the origin of Earth and the universe that are at odds with the view in modern science. Last but not least, we have people who believe the Earth is still flat. So you can see Western culture is uh, not synonymous with modern science. Second, modernization has to do with this rapid change in culture and change with science and in technology. And we all see it happening so fast, it's hard to, it's hard to know from one minute to the next what, what to believe because we're learning. That's what's happening. But let's understand that modernization is not a thing unique to Western culture, that Native American cultures are also in a modernizing environment. And so modern Native people uh, have indigenous perspectives that should not be conflated with traditional Native perspectives of 500 years ago any more than Western people should think of themselves as pre-Copernican. And so when you talk to Native people today, both you and they have had to go through modernization of their cultures. They may come at modern, uh, modernization from different starting points, different cultural starting points, but we all have this going on. Last but not least, as part of modernization, communication globally is, is so rapidly accelerating that we have uh, an immensely pluralistic society. Culturals, cultures across the globe are trading ideas, going back and forth, uh, and all of us are benefiting from a pluralistic cultural society. I think the more that you try to see the world through other cultural eyes, the better you see it, period. And certainly, the better you understand fellow humans. If you look only through the lens of your own culture, we have a word for that, ethnocentric. Now, since any lens that you look at the world with is just a lens, um, you may be limiting your understanding. Uh, I have gotten newly into photography and I have a series of different lenses and I have a zoom for one thing and a wide angle for another and I would feel very limited if I could only use one lens. I know that I couldn't see all the things I want to see. An ethnocentric position limits you to that one lens and you are a richer human being if you can see life through many different lenses and globalization is making us do that whether we even agree to it or not. Well, what's this all mean for having a star party or going out at night and looking at the sky? Uh, again, remember, if you just look at the sky and you don't have any cultural background, whether it be a scientific background or a richer cultural tradition, uh, you won't appreciate it much. And I know people that are like that. They you know, just go out and look at stars and they just don't look at them for five minutes and then they're impatient and have to do something else. Well, they're missing out. Uh, let's take a look here at one of the biggest observations uh, that people make when they first look at the sky, and that is the Big Dipper. You can see four different presentations of the Big Dipper there. Um, and if you started to look at the Dip Big Dipper the first time, it's easily prominent in the sky. Its stars are pretty bright. They're sort of equally spaced. You can really notice it. If you looked at it one hour, say 9 o'clock, and then came back and wanted to see it again at, say, 11 o'clock, it would not be in the same position. What is up with that? Now, this is an observation that Native societies, of course, made regularly. They didn't have artificial light. They saw the sky a lot more than you and I do and more regularly, and they paid attention to it. Uh, what they noticed and what you can notice if you make consecutive time-separated observations is that the Big Dipper and all of the stars are rotating around a central point during the night. And they start at one position, and the following night they go back and they come to that position. Uh, this gives them a sort of 24-hour-ish uh, clock-like presence. In fact, some people used to refer to this from the northern Mexico native perspective as the Yaqui clock. So the Yaqui would use this uh, as a time during the night, and when a Yaqui 
uh, Indian was uh, working together with a uh, cattle drive, which has happened in southern Texas, they would use the Yaki clock to tell the time uh, for the midnight watch. And they would tell uh, some uh, hapless cowboy when the Big Dipper gets from where it is now to, you know, some other place, then your watch is done. And that's how they told the night time. Now, the biggest trick that you would play on a greenhorn was point not to the Big Dipper, but to that dot there in the middle, which is the North Star, sometimes known as Polaris. And that one doesn't move. Everything moves around it during the night. And so if you wanted to get a little extra time, you tell the greenhorn, uh, watch that middle star and... Uh, when it moves, then you can come and get me and your night watch is over. Well, of course, it doesn't move. And so you have somebody staring at a spot on the sky, waiting and falling asleep. And that was a trick you would play. So here is an observation that is easily made, and you can make it in your star party. Uh, one thing I didn't tell you, though, is that this clock, the Yankee clock, it runs a little fast. In fact, it runs on average four minutes fast. So... The Big Dipper comes back to the same place in the sky on the following night, four minutes ahead of schedule. And this adds up. And over three months' time of four minutes every day for three months, uh, then in the next season, at that same time of night, it's no longer anywhere near that position. It's like 90 degrees off. And so this also has a seasonal aspect to it. If you looked at the sky the same time every night, let's say you look at it before you go to bed every night, um, and by some miraculous uh, chance, you go to bed the same time every night. I don't know how you do that, but some people do. You would find that in the summer, the Big Dipper was in a completely different place when you watched at that time of night than in the fall or the winter or the spring. So there is this seasonal aspect, and indeed Native societies use the seasonal positions of constellations at a particular time of night to very accurately tell the time of year. All right, so this is an observation. Native societies make it, we can make it too. Uh, what about the explanation? How would you explain this motion of stars um, in a cultural perspective? Well, I think the easiest thing to explain is our modern perspective, it's the simplest. Um, here you see on the left a star trail map. This is simply an exposure of stars taken over a period of time, maybe an hour or something. And you can see they leave these rotational tracks. So you can see how they look. Uh, but in modern science, one of the big uh, leaps forward in concept was to understand it's not the stars that are moving. It's the Earth. It's us. And so you see on the right a cartoon. You see the Earth. And the Earth is rotating about an axis of rotation that points right to the North Star. Wow, how did that happen? Total coincidence. In fact, it doesn't point exactly to the North Star. And if you had a telescope and watch the North Star, it too makes a little circle around a point that has no naked eye star equivalent. It's just such a small circle that you can't really see it with the naked eye uh, from time to time. So it's kind of a coincidence. That's why the North Star is the North Star. So the modern science explanation is that the Earth moves, unless you feel glib and su superior about our ability to understand that. Understand that when uh, this was first uh, put forward, and uh, this is also post-Copernican, um, Western culture resisted it like no tomorrow. We, have, we did not want to believe that our Earth was moving because it doesn't feel like it is, right? Uh, well, that's where the trick is. And of course, uh, we have Galileo uh, who is going into exile, not just for the Earth orbiting the Sun, but also for the Earth rotating itself. And uh, this was resisted in Western culture. What about the North Star itself in modern science? Of course, this brings up the whole issue of what are stars at all? How I wonder what you are. And it took modern science quite a while to come up with its contemporary explanation of that, especially the idea that stars are suns. Now that seems ridiculous. We all have seen and felt the light of the sun. It's enormously bright. These stars are nothing like that. How could those little dim specks be a sun? Short answer, they're ridiculously far away. And astronomers early on could calculate 
how far away they'd have to be to be suns. And it was larger than any distance that occurs on planet Earth by factors of millions and, tr and billions. It was just ridiculous. So that idea was resisted too. Finally accepted. So in modern science, if you look up at the North Star, uh, you can culturally, through the perspective of modern science, understand what you're seeing uh, in more detail than just the little photons that come to you would tell you. If you see on the left, we see that Polaris is actually a system of three stars. There's Polaris A, that's the one that most of the light comes from, and that's what you're seeing. There's Polaris B, a little farther away, and then there's something called Polaris AB, which is a binary companion to the big Polaris. Um, you wouldn't necessarily know it. Polaris is not a particularly bright star, but that star is enormously bright. It is over a thousand times brighter than the sun. It is, has a diameter of over 37 times as wide as the sun. Now think about what that means for a minute. If our sun, if you place 37 suns side by side, and then that was the diameter of some ginormous star in the Earth's sky, that would take out a big piece of sky and pretty much fry everything on Earth. And that would, that would be Polaris. So now look at all the riches of interesting uh, properties of, of a star that we can get through modern science. Um, still confused about finding the North Star, especially because it's not particularly bright. The Big Dipper is your helper. If you look on the right, so, uh, you can see the Big Dipper. And the two stars at the end of the ladle are sometimes called the pointer stars. If you draw a line between them and then point it uh, further on than the first semi-bright star that you'll come to is the North Star. So those are the North Star pointer stars. So now you have a way to go find the North Star, think about what it means for modern science. What does it mean from other cultural perspectives? Uh, let's talk a, briefly about the Navajo perspective. I'll refer you to another talk by Brian Bates because he talks about this more in detail, uh, but I just wanted to uh, briefly touch on it. You can see there's Polaris, the, the modern name for the North Star, and the Big Dipper. And there's another prominent constellation on the other side of the North Star called Cassiopeia in modern terms. Uh, these three objects together are a, a combination that the Navajo astronomy interprets. Uh, the Big Dipper is interpreted not as a dipper, but as a man. And this man revolves around the North Star, so he's a revolving man. Nahokos Bika. Uh, the other constellation, Cassiopeia, is a woman in Greek astronomy, but is also a woman in Navajo astronomy. She's also a revolving woman, Nahokos Biad. And they are revolving around Polaris, which is interpreted as a central fire. And together, these make up basically the foundational elements of a family in a Hogan. Uh, here's kind of the artistic uh, description of rotating man and or revolving man and revolving woman. And uh, the central fire is the element of a hogan. You can see in the middle picture there, a little fire ring. And typically in this traditional residence of the Navajo, uh, the family is living there with the central fire. And what does this kind of pastoral picture tell you? It gives you a picture of harmony gives you a picture of a family in harmony. Uh, the word for beauty, harmony in Navajo is hosho. And so when you look up at the North Star and at these constellations, you should immediately get the impression and impact of a sense of social uh, harmony and harmony with nature. This is not something our modern scientific uh, interpre interpretation tells you anything about. I mean, you know, a star that would blast all the atmosphere off the earth is not necessarily harmonious, right? So now you have an added cultural perspective to look up in the night sky. If you've had a chaotic day that was not harmonious, you can look up at the night sky and you can see revolving man and revolving woman around a central fire and just take a deep breath and go back into harmony. Now, as I said, Brian Bates, I'm sure in his talk, we'll talk more about this. So let's go to a different cultural interpretation of a different tribe. You know, we often use the term native astronomy, and uh, that's kind of off because we shouldn't use it in the singular. There are hundreds of tribes in the Americas alone, 
and they all have variants of their view of the night sky. So it really should be plural, native astronomies. And you can see that here when we look at a different tribal interpretation of the North Star. Um, this tribe, Kaibab Paiute, uh, used to be uh, the occupier of almost all of the northern Arizona Strip north of the Grand Canyon, including the Kaibab Plateau. They occupied a very wide range before European invasion. Uh, now they uh, subsist on a small reservation near the uh, on the Arizona-Utah border. You can see there in the map Kaibab Indian Reservation. And that's a wonderfully dark sky region. They so valued their astronomy traditions that they applied for and received uh, dark sky status from the International Dark Sky Association. And they were the first dark sky nation. And you can see in that print there, uh, that they value the stories that they tell about the night sky, uh, and they value their ability to see all the stars which remind them of those stories. So what do they think about the North Star? Why does the North Star stand still? Well, uh, I'm going to point up the main spots here, and I uh, ap apologetically have to report that I won't be telling this story the way a wonderful Paiute er elder would tell it, which would take a great deal more time, and you can imagine, and would have beautiful aspects to it. But uh, here we'll just give you the highlights. So in this view, the whole sky is referenced to Wampyaf, and long ago it was like Earth. And this is a, a common thread in native astronomies, that uh, as above, so below is something the Hopi say, uh, and that the Earth above, uh, or sorry, the Earth below and the sky above are heavily related. So in this view, uh, early on, the sky was like Earth. It had rivers, valleys, trees, and especially it had animals. And these animals were restless, and so they would run around, and that's kind of why things run around in the sky now. But there's one aspect of the sky they want to explain. These animals were equivalent to the stars and constellations, and the Paiute word for that is putsiev. And so you can see they're looking at the sky and they're seeing a whole world, not just objects or a machine, they're seeing beings. And they notice there's one star that doesn't travel. This star, of course, is the North Star. And they have a beautiful story about it, that this star was once a mountain sheep and with the name Naga. And he was the son of a Paiute god. Shin up. So here's elevated staff. Notice this is very different from the Navajo story of a central fire, completely different being. Naga was brave and daring, sure-footed and courageous, and he was a mountain climber. And, and he, had, he had the mountain climbers, climbers fever, you know. Why do you climb the mountain? Because it's there. And the bigger the better, and the more the better. And he was just con constantly trying to accomplish the best mountain climbs. Now notice, this is a very different value. It's a complementary value to that of social harmony and beauty, but it favors the individual. Here, there's an individual who is testing himself and trying to achieve all that he can. Um, this individual, of course, is a bighorn sheep, but no problem there. So how did he become the North Star? Well, Naga, always trying to climb the best mountain, he came upon this one particular mountain. And it was tough. It was slick all the way down. There was no way to get handholds or footholds, and he couldn't get up it. Uh, so what to do? And he crawled. He he climbed around the periphery, and he found a little what appeared to be a little cave. And looking inside, there was a tunnel inside this cave. And he realized this tunnel started to climb upward inside the mountain. And he thought, well, maybe. Maybe I can get to the top of the mountain from the inside. So he started to climb. And lots of things happen on this journey that a complete telling of this story will bring to you. And they're fabulous. But they have to do with the difficulty of any effort that's heroic. He starts to climb through and uh, the tunnel gets very narrow. He tries to squeeze through. He's getting scratched and bloody. And finally, he's, he's going to give up. And as well, this is not going to work. It's not going to go to the top. So I'm going to turn around. So he's going to turn around. He starts to go down, but then there's a rock fall. 
and the opening to the tunnel at the bottom is closed. Whoa, he is trapped. Sounds like some kind of horror movie here. He's stuck and he has no choice but to try harder to go on up to the top. And he squeezes through and eventually he sees a little light opening at the end of this inner tunnel. He gets out to the top and there he is. And for a moment, he's extremely excited. He's climbed this heretofore unclimbable mountain. He's achieved a very great thing. Surely all the other animals below can see him and think, wow, he's really hot stuff. And then he thought for a minute, uh, I can't get back down. I'm going to die here. And he consoles himself in one version of the story. There's some grass at the top. He goes, well, okay, uh, you know, I'll live here for a while, but I climbed the unclimbable mountain. It's okay. I may die, but I achieved a great thing. About this time, his father, who is a god, but is still walking around below, is calling his son and uh, gets no answer. And finally spies him at the top of the mountain. And he's extremely sad because his son is trapped and he won't be able to see him again. And uh, his godlike powers have certain limits, I guess, because he can't just whisk up there and bring him down, but he can do other things. And what he eventually does is turn Naga into a star. And so here is a little bit of a, a quoted narrative from that, which I'd just like to read to you. I will not let my brave son die, said Shinop. I will turn him into a star, and he can stand there and shine where everyone can see him. He shall be a guide mark for all the living things on the earth or in the sky. So Naga became a star that every living thing can see. It's the only star that will always be found at the same place. Always he stands still. Directions are set by him. Travelers looking up at him can always find their way. He does not move around as the other stars do, and so he's called the fixed star. And because he is in the true north all the time, the Paiute people call him Kwiami Wintuk Putsi. These words mean the North Star. So there, you have a beautiful story, uh, a cultural perspective on the North Star. It teaches lessons about personal achievement, uh, difficulty, overcoming, etc., that are complementary to uh, the lessons of the Navajo version, which are uh, cultural harmony and social harmony. And uh, you can now look at the North Star and you can see three different ways of thinking of it. You can see two different native traditions and you can see a modern interpretation. And in our pluralistic cultural society, it is perfectly permissible to hold them all in your mind at once and be enriched. And so that is the major point of my talk that both native and modern science narratives enrich our experience of the night sky. And I hope you can learn more of them. Enjoy it the way I do. Thank you.